I take it as so normal, this subject, because for so many years it's, I've studied it and been around people and they talk about it. Most of my social groups, which isn't very many, but my social groups are based around this. What's being talked about is total freedom. But it's not freedom for the person. You don't become free. Because you is the cage, you is the limitation. The you has been taught though that freedom, what you're looking for, is always found in objects, is always found in the next event, is always found in time. Freedom is time. Freedom is the ability to seek in time. And freedom is you getting things. But actually you, the one that thinks it has to get things in time, is a trap, is a cage. Somebody's just asking me what dog breed is he, uh, he, um, Khaleesi is, Isi is, um, <laughs> I can't help it, I just love dogs, when I was a kid, I was the kid that had my whole wallpaper as dogs, I just collected posters, posters of dogs and my whole room <laughs> was pictures of dogs, and then when I was a teenager I always wanted to wear t-shirts with pictures of dogs on them, and my friends wouldn't let me. They wouldn't go out with me if I wore an animal. <laughs> and then when I was at school and these girls bullied me, they used to call me a bitch when they were bullying me and I would think, or a dog, and I would think, hmm, well, this is quite a good insult, really. <laughs> and my, my other friends saw that I brought it in from my obsession with dogs. <laughs> that nickname. Um... Uh, what breed is Khaleesi? Um, she isn't a breed, she's many generations on the streets of breeding, so I don't think there's any de definite breed. Um, but when I've read about dogs, because she was the hardest dog I've ever had, I've had dogs all my life, and honestly I've never had a dog like that before. And um, I think that she's got similar personality to Ben Basenji, which is the most similar to a wild dog. It's the Egyptian dogs that sit and watch and they're often depicted in Egyptian art. Those the ones like that. And um and the Sendi out of all the dog breeds is the hardest dog to try and change. <laughs> She's so hard. <laughs> but I love it. I find her so exciting. <laughs> uh 
Um, but if you're not experienced with dogs, I, I mean, actually, to be honest with you, if I was to get a dog again, I would get something similar to Khaleesi. But if you're not experienced with dogs, I wouldn't get a dog like Khaleesi. Um, the pointy, basically pointy ears and curly up tail, don't get a dog with that. That means that they're going to be more um, focused on the environment, hunting, and they're just going to be more independent. Get a floppy dog with floppy ears and droopy face. If you're not experienced. Sorry, guys. Okay, we've got to talk about non jihadi not dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Laura. And guys, you know, it makes it so much easier for me because everyone always has bizarre names on Ustream and Skype. If you put a picture that's actually you in your picture, that really makes it easier for me. Because I have so many contacts on Skype and on Ustream. And then they have a funny name and a funny picture. And I might have spoken to you loads of times before, but I have no idea who you are on Skype. So if you put a picture of yourself, this would be um, helpful, rather than of an egg or a banana or whatever the pictures are. Actually, you stream not so bad. On Skype, it's terrible. Okay. So in the beginning, there is just boundlessness. There is just freedom everywhere. And we can say the beginning is when the baby's born, but that's not really the beginning. That's just what memory the human has. Normally the human only has memory till when the baby was born, since the baby was born. Um, but actually, beingness is endless and doesn't start at the birth of the body. But if we start at the birth of the body, because that's what these instruments maintain or hold, these memories. So when the baby was born, <coughs> there was just freedom everywhere. The baby didn't have a sense that it was inside the body looking at the world. It didn't have a sense that it was alive or that it was born or that it was good or bad or happy or sad. It didn't have a sense of the cot or the mother's breast and its lips. It didn't know the difference. It didn't have the ability to think about the difference. So there wasn't a difference. There was just boundless aliveness looking through the instrument of a baby. Just being baby, experiencing baby. And that essence, that watcher, that experiencer, was all things. It wasn't located anywhere. It wasn't inside the baby looking at the world. There was simply all things appearing. And their appearance was the seeing. Their sound was the hearing. Somebody's trying to get into my house. Ah! <laughs> and then as this baby gets a little bit older, the cognitive functioning begins, where it begins to think. Um, one friend told me about, with both his children, what the baby did was at first it would have an object and then it would throw the object over its head no response and they would have it they would throw the object over its head no response of the object throw it over its head and then eventually it would throw the object and it would look at the object and it would throw the object and it would look and then eventually after doing that for a long period of time it would throw the object and then cry and i get the sense what the brain had registered was the thing could exist when it didn't see it so at first when it threw the object, the object was just gone. But then when it registered that it still existed back there, it cried at its absence. So when the brain begins to think, 
and begins the cognitive functioning, a sense that I am inside begins, me, there is a looker, there is an experience, rather than everything experiencing itself, the things being the experience, uh, it became somebody looking at the things somebody experiencing the things and at this point it wasn't that much suffering but as soon as that happened there was a sense that something had been lost there was a tiny sense that it had been cut, cut off for something from something or a seed that there was something missing because before there wasn't the divide there was simply wholeness there was god looking at itself through all things. But then when the baby began to exist, it felt like something was missing. Something had been taken away, but it was so subtle, a tiny little seed, like sitting on a thousand or 10, maybe only 10 or five, um, mattresses and a little tiny rock underneath. There's only a tiny little sense of it. Maybe not a thousand, maybe five. Maybe only two mattresses. Okay, that wasn't a very good metaphor, my bad, sorry. I was thinking of the pea, the princess and the pea. And they all got scrabbled. Squab <laughs> they don't always work. <laughs> So there is a seed that something's missing. And then society begins to validate that. It begins to tell the baby, you've got to be good. You've got to be nice to your brother or sister. You've got to put your toys away, which is great. I mean, I love it that I have this manipulative ability over Khaleesi and that I can tell her if she does something, she gets a treat. Khaleesi is so independent, though, that she's like, yeah, F you. I'm going to eat some dog turd. And off she goes. Um, but it begins to validate that seed that something's missing. And it goes to school and then it suddenly all becomes about education. And our education system is so bad. And I don't normally give advice, although I've been giving a lot more lately. But don't send your kids to mainstream school. Oh my god. It's so bad. Because what they do in mainstream school is they are always telling, oh God, I'm going to get so many calls now about how you can't afford to not send your kid to mainstream school. Oh, sorry, <laughs> shouldn't have said this. Fabia! <laughs> but basically what they're teaching the kid constantly is what are you going to be when you're older? I was always asked that. And you know what I thought? I thought I wanted to be a writer or an actress. Not particularly because... I liked it, but because I thought, if I'm that, then I can be all things. I can do every job. If I'm an actress, then I can be the lawyer, I can be the prisoner, I can be the criminal, I could be all of the different things. I didn't have to be one thing. And it was always, what are you going to be? I don't know if it's particularly an English thing, or living around London. It was always based on what, what you're going to do, what you're going to do. And I remember it used to give me terror, the idea of it. And I learned, I remember at some point, that to deflect the question, and it also made the adults laugh, I would say, I'm going to marry a rich American, because in America you get 40% 40 um, 40 of the divorce proceeds or something. My mum must have told me, or, some, or I must have watched it on TV, and everyone would laugh. If I hated the question, and it was all the time. In every class, it was always about future and what you're going to do when you leave school. And they never taught you practical things. They taught you things which you don't actually need to know that much about. I don't think I've ever used algebra. Um, and they didn't really, again, I don't know if it's an English school, encourage um, individual qualities. They just tried to get everyone to the same standard. And they encourage so much competition. Which competition can be fun, and it's not like that shouldn't happen, but it was constantly about comparing yourself to the peer. Now, I was a failure at school. 
an absolute failure. So everyone's like, well, that's why she's so negative about it. Um, but because I was very cute, I um, I succeeded in a bizarre way. Like I, I was very good at the social side of things. So I would always befriend the most intelligent kid in the class. <laughs> <laughs> and I still do it. I love intelligent people. They're so crazy. And they always love my, they always say, simplicity. Um, but also I do have an insanely creative and beautiful intelligence, but it's not the intelligence in which they teach you at school. The intelligence at school is normally based around memory and remembering how to do things and um, memorising things a lot of the time. And uh, I didn't have that. I could. It was. I could. I, I could understand things if people explained them to me through word of mouth. I could understand them normally way before any of my classmates did. But when it came to writing it all down or reading it from a book, I'd be like, um, and I ended up getting my bachelor's of arts from a good university. But the only reason I did it was because I was always pretend, uh, befriending intelligent friends that were successful in the classroom to um, help me. But I didn't even know I was doing that. I just, when I look back, I'm like, oh, I did always do that. And I'm still friends with a few of them now. They're brain boxes always. And so we go into this education system that doesn't support enjoying what is or, or doing what you love, which is the mm. most important thing. It supports fear of the future. Don't send your kids to mainstream school. But if they have to go, that's their karma. That's the way it goes. <laughs> We're taught never to trust ourselves never to trust what we feel we are taught to be like robots to always work for the future and it works it works so well and we've been in such an unfair society for so many generations because this works because of the se sense of separation because there is a seed that something was lost and that something's not quite right from when identification started it works when society says to you yes you're wrong do this instead and you've got to work to the future you've got to get all these things so greed works we're constantly taught to be greedy and to take things and to compete and that this is our success do we not see how insane our society is success in our society is how much better you are than your neighbor what sort of society is that? How many more things you have than your neighbour? How many more holidays you've been on? What size house you live in? What kind of shoes you have? What kind of label you have? And it is changing, but it's slow because we're so addicted to trying to fulfil ourselves. And we're so addicted to comparison and finding our validation through comparing ourselves. And even in a way, these talks work a little bit like that. And I hope, I really hope that it comes across my encouragement to follow that sense of love and resonance and not following the fear that I've got something that you don't and that you need to listen to me because there's something that you don't have. I, I try to always encourage that you listen to this for the love of it because it reminds you of your own love, your love of being. And that's all these talks are meant to do. And it's not meant to be saying you're bad or you're wrong or you've got something wrong or encouraging that fear. It's meant to be touching that sense of love. And then eventually it's seen that whole world is love. Everything is love. It wasn't ever you loving it. Your nature was love. And when you stopped trying to be something, there was that love. And I get the sense that it sometimes works in a way that you fall in love with the teacher. Like you totally lose yourself in them. But it's not really about that. 
but it's like she or he represents your true nature and the mind says oh, there it is that's what I want but it's you this message is you it's you telling yourself about non-duality again not you as a separation not you as a limitation but as that beingness because all there is is beingness everywhere and beingness played the losing the heartache the being removed from it the finding in things and then it presents the truth which is so beautiful it's so miraculous And I dislike capitalism. I really dislike it. Um, ultimately, everything's perfect. But um, I would love it if these talks and retreats could totally be offered for free. One thing that I loved about Ramesh and going to see Ramesh was that um, he used to offer the talks by donation at his house every day. And I just thought that was wonderful. That it was for everyone. And then people would donate to him. But it was never about the money. But people had to have enough money to go and stay there for periods of time to listen to him. So this message is about remembering that love of all things. The simplicity of what is. The what is is enough. The gift was always what was happening, not where you were going. The you, the you going somewhere took over. The you going over uh, somewhere in time, which was only ever a functioning, became centre stage. And then it got based on so many stresses, where you're going to end up. What's it going to look like? What's happened to you? Where you've been? What does this mean? And then it encourages thinking in opposites. Backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And it encourages um, a removal. And sometimes that game can be fun. I don't mean to say it's always negative. When you kiss your lover for the first moment, or um, will you buy your first house? I mean, those sorts of enjoyments or pleasures really change because no longer are they fulfilling, fulfilling anything. And so they become really unimportant. But while you feel separate, then they're really important. And I, 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 the other day I was walking through a little village and I saw two young people kissing, they must have only been about 14, and dirty pervy Lisa was watching, but um, I saw them kissing and I, I just had that memory of first love. My first kisses were always a huge disappointment, but I remember the, the like build up to it and the heart fluttering and whether or not they liked you and uh, the excitement of um, the attention, and if they looked at you, you're like, oh. and then the gossiping with your friends. Me and my friends used to do crazy things. <laughs> we were so naughty. Although they're both mothers now. Oh, one of them's a mother, and one of them's expecting mother, so suddenly these stories always go a bit blank, like if I ever bring them up. <laughs> um, but we used to do things like, um, one time we told our parents we were going to Um, I can't. I can't remember what we said we were going to. My dad dropped us off, 
we said we were going to the specific scouting event or something and then when we got there there was like old people playing bingo in the town but we thought that my dad didn't realize and then we were going to like crawl across the river and maybe we we're going to go to some boy's house or something or smoke some um, drugs i'm not sure and um <laughs> but my dad caught us because he realized there were old people in this hall he used to do some crazy stuff and there was so much fun and excitement and beauty in that but after a while it gets tiresome you do it i remember when i turned 18 i was like well wow, there's no fun in all these drugs and drinking anymore now that i can legally do it i remember the excitement was breaking the law and like dun, dun, da, da, dun, dun. Like, i remember we were so up to stuff we'd be sneaking out of windows and crawling through bushes Getting people to buy us alcohol. Um, but after you've done everything a hundred times, then it begins to lose its flavour excitement. And then after a while, all those highs stop being high. You begin to not be able to find it in the pleasures. It's like you've done everything. And I really tried everything. I tried Well, I didn't try murdering someone. I didn't go to prison. I'd nearly been arrested a few times. Um, I was never arrested, actually. Well, I'm sure there's things that you guys can think of that I haven't done, but I really tried it all. It's like, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? And that there was great excitement in doing all these things and learning all these different things. But then eventually there comes a point where your heart really begins to ache because you begin to realise you can't find it anywhere. Everything you try. Or maybe you're the opposite type of person. You're not the type of person that goes out and tries it all. But you're the type of person that wants to but always fears it, is always scared of risking it. Yeah, my nature was never scared of risking it. But that doesn't mean that that's the way the story has to go. But this game of always seeking makes this become dead. You see, there's such beauty here. There's such freedom here. I've said this a thousand times before. I remember the first time I began to hear this message was through Buddhism, where they'd say you've got to be in the moment. And even when they said that, it sent tingles all through my body. Even now, it begins to make me want to cry because I knew what they meant. I knew that through my constant seeking, I was missing life. I'd be kissing the boyfriend and thinking about the next boyfriend or how it used to be better or my worries or my problems. Or I'd be traveling the world and doing all these different things and I was lost in time. I 
couldn't feel things properly. There was such an activity of me and time, I couldn't feel the silkiness of my dog's coat or the walking along. I was always stuck in here, in imagination. And there's such love and light here. This and this, there are no problems. Khaleesi has no problems. And if she... <laughs> if she knew firstly that her owner is a little bit risque, she doesn't know that. And secondly, the amount of times that we've nearly been homeless. And thirdly, that she's also a little bit of what our society would call a vicious dog. And so she's always slightly on the edge of stuff. <laughs> she doesn't, she's never, to my knowledge, bitten anyone. Um, but she's got strong, such a strong pull to react to things that she's afraid of with, fear, with uh, aggression. But she has no sense of that. To her, it's simply happening. The fear, the immediacy, the growling, the aggression. The moving home, the different place. Tomorrow we take a boat to Barcelona. Um, no, not to Barcelona, to Ibiza, from Barcelona. And to her, it just is. The, the little paws, her little beautiful paws are on the floor. The smells, the sounds. And that is the whole universe. And in that is God. In that is total mystery. In that is the divine. We looked in the wrong places. We looked in particular things and we looked in time. And it's not even you that comes back to the moment. You can't even exist here. Because you is already an afterthought. Because who are you here? But total mystery. Who can you be? What can you name yourself to be? All there is is life. This mysterious, this miraculous, this colourful, this totally bizarre life. Look at it. You're sitting there looking at somebody talking in a computer. But in this instant you have no idea of that. That's simply thinking that's registered that and said that's what it is. If you stop thinking, it's a total mystery. But yet, if you stop thinking and you forget about you and the energy stops of you and the energy of other stops, you have no sense of that. It's just a mystery. It's totally free and boundless. It's not right or wrong or started or stopped. It just is. It's just happening. Um, unlimited possibilities. If it stops being about what you think you know and what you are, it's unlimited possibility. It's a world full of adventure. Me and Khaleesi are always on adventure. <laughs> what do you say, Easy? Easy. Miss Spaceship. Hey. Where's your puppy boo? Where's your... Where's your puppy boo boo? She's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's have a look. <laughs>